opportunity that we have tonight to come together and to your presence, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we invite you into the sanctuary tonight to fill us with your love, to fill us with your spirit, Lord. Draw us closer to you, Lord, through every song that is sung, through every word that's spoken, Lord. Let it all be done to bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, we give you praise for all that you have done. In Jesus' name. Lord, we 
we thank you, Jesus, and we bless your name tonight. In Jesus' name. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise?
Watson, pastor of First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma. We are a local church with a worldwide vision of reaching out to people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the next few minutes, we want to reach out to you through the messages preached in this broadcast. As you watch this message, we pray that God will speak to your heart and that your life will be forever changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. This is now our 17th study on the Gospel of Luke. And we are getting near the time where uh, we call it the, the week of the Passion of Christ in the, the Gospel of Luke. And we'll be uh, learning about Jesus as he makes his way into Jerusalem, so as he faces the cross of Calvary. Tonight, we're in Luke chapter 18. Jesus has been teaching in parables. In verse 1, the Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always to pray and ought to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. In other words, she wants to be set free. She wants to be protected. Verse 4, And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. In these first eight verses, we see a parable that I want to call the persistent widow. And this is in a lesson that Jesus was teaching on the subject of prayer. As a child of God, as a Christian, as a born again believer, we have a responsibility to always pray. We pray first of all because prayer is the way you and I communicate with God. We pray because we want to talk to God and we read the Word of God. We study the Word of God because that is how God speaks to us. You see, communication is a two-way process. Communication involves participation by both parties. If, if all we were doing was just reading our Bible, we're not communicating with God because we are not talking to Him. If all we ever did was pray, it is still not a, a communication. We must pray, we must read the Word of God because when we do both of those together, we are having a two-way conversation. Amen. For many years, I taught children's church at, at Van Buren. And we used to sing a song with our boys and girls, and the song said, If you read your Bible and pray every day, you will grow, grow, grow. And if we don't read our Bible and pray every day, if we don't get into the Word of God, if we don't pray, we're going to shrink. It's, that's the way it is in our spiritual life. If we want to grow spiritually, we've got to be nourished. If we want to grow physically, we've got to be nourished. It's the same situation. The communication is a two-way process. And so God has told us everything that we need to know in order to survive life in its physical state and to survive life spiritually when we study the Word of God. God wants to hear from us, and He hears from us when we go to Him in prayer. When things are going good in life, when things are looking down, it makes no difference what we face. We still need to go to Him in prayer. We still need to praise His name. When we deal with problems in life, when it seems as if all hope is gone, we still need to praise Him. And because God is going to give us the patience to endure through problems of life, all we've got to do is ask in faith, and He he will guide us. He will direct us. He will lead us through those situations. And He will help us make the right decisions in our life. A child of God is always to pray. Jesus tells us in verse 1 that we should always pray and not faint. In other words, don't give up on an answer to the situation. In other words, if you do not understand what is going on and you do not know the outcome, you have a responsibility to still pray. You may not know the answer. 
You may not know where the answer is coming from. You may not even know how the answer is going to take place. You may not even know the source. But one thing that is important that you must know is that you and I serve a God who is still on the throne. He is still able to supply every need. He knows what you have need of. He knows what you are facing before you ever ask. He is still a healer. He is still a provider. He is still a deliverer. He is still the redeemer of mankind. He is still the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He is still able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. He is still able to supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's who our God is. And so what we see in this text tonight is a story about an unmerciful judge and a persistent widow. See, this judge had no respect for God. He had no respect for humanity and people to this judge basically seemed worthless to him. You see, one day there was a widow that came to stand before this judge. And this woman had been troubled for some time. And she had an adversary. In other words, there was someone who would not leave her alone. But she wanted freedom from her circumstance. She wanted freedom from her adversary. She wanted justice to be done. And so she came to this judge and she was asking this judge. In fact, she was more than asking. She was demanding. She was pleading for help from this judge. And she was telling this judge her rights were being violated, that she needed some help, that she needed deliverance. But this judge did not want to give her the time of day. He did not want to listen to her, but this woman did not give up. She was not going to take no for an answer. She was not going to quit pleading. She was not going to quit asking. She was not going to quit until she got what she came for. See, the judge finally had a confession to make. He said in his chambers, he said, you know, this has been going on long enough. I'm tired of this woman griping. I'm tired of this woman complaining. I'm tired of her going on and on about her trouble. Something's got to be done. I'm going to have to, to set her free. I'm going to have to bring justice to her situation. Otherwise, she's going to literally drive me insane. She had an answer on the way because she did not give up. You see, the story serves as an example and to remind you and I, when we feel the enemy coming against us in life, when we feel as if our adversary, Satan, the devil, is beating us down and trying to take us down and, and whip us and to steal from us and to torture us day and night. And, and all the time we're pleading with God and we're asking God to take care of the situation. And it seems as though that our, our faith is being tested. And what God is doing, He is waiting on us to see if we are willing to let go of that situation and give it all to Him and to trust in Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, or if he, if we're just going to throw in the towel and give up and say, you know, I'm just going to try to do it on my own strength. I'm not satisfied with the answer. I'm going to try to do it my way. See, when, when we try to do it our way, it only makes the situation much worse. But we know in the Word of God that, that we're not able to take care of it. We don't have the, the authority to overcome every obstacle that comes our way. There are some things in life that we cannot do without God's help. That's why we must determine in our spirit that we are not going to be defeated. We are not going to be cast down. We're not going to be destroyed. We're not going to be uh, uh, brought down into this world. But we're going to rise above that obstacle. We're going to become victorious. We're going to be an overcomer because the victory, if you are a child of God, the victory belongs to you because greater is He that is in you than he that is in this world. And we must know in our heart and believe in our heart beyond any shadow of a doubt that if God be for us who can be against us we will overcome we will overcome by the blood of the lamb we will overcome by the word of our testimony you see we serve a God that has all power he has all authority he has the answer and he knows what you need he knows what you are going through and so we declare in our spirit and we believe in our heart that the devil has done all he possibly can do to 
trying to steal our joy and trying to destroy our life. But we also know in the Word of God that the Bible says that Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. And so we know that we're going to overcome. So child of God, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel because the battle's not over until God says it over. And we have read the end of the book and the end of the book says that we win because God is still on the throne. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will see you through. Blessed be His name. Let's move on to verse number 9. The Bible goes on to say, And He spake this parable, and the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this public. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. In these verses we see the parable of the Pharisee and the public. Jesus taught this parable to us to convince people who only trust in themselves and their own righteousness of how they are despised by other people. You see, they, the Pharisees were praying with the wrong intentions. When we pray and we go to the Lord in prayer, He knows the intentions of our heart. He knows our desires. He knows the reasons that we come to Him in prayer. And He knows how serious we are when we pray. And so when this Pharisee was praying, he was praying boastfully. He was praying self-righteously. He was praying loudly and he was praising himself as he was there in the temple praying. When this Pharisee was praying, he acted as though he was somebody important. He said, I'm not like other men in this community. I am not an unjust person. He said, I pay my tithes faithfully. I pray and I fast. I keep the commandments. I never commit adultery. He said, I'm a good person. You know, he's the kind of an individual, if, if you ask him to write a book about the person they most admire in life, it would be an autobiography. That's how much he thought about himself. He, he thought he was the example of how to live life. He thought, I'm the perfect example. See, the Pharisee was full of himself. He was full of his own goodness. See, we need to be careful in life not to present ourselves as a, a prideful individual. But we need to humble ourselves when we pray. When you look at the publican, he didn't boast about anything. He didn't uh, try to set himself up above anyone else. But the Bible tells us that he bowed his head. That he humbled himself before God. That, that he was weeping bitter tears. That he was beating upon his chest. And he said, God, be merciful upon me. Be merciful upon me, a sinner. You see, this publican knew that he was not perfect, but he served a perfect God. He knew that he did not have all the answers in life, but he served a God who was all-knowing and who had all the answers. He knew that he in his own life was not holy, but he knew that he served a just and holy God. You see, when he prayed, when this publican prayed, his prayer was full of humility. His prayer was full of repentance for sin because he desired a deeper relationship with God. His prayer was short but his prayer was to the point he prayed God be merciful to me a sinner the Bible says Jesus said that this this publican was justified for his prayer his prayer was answered he knew that he was a sinner he knew that he could not make it on his own strength but his total dependence was upon the mercy of God God's glory resists those who are proud but to those who are humble, those are the people that he gives his grace to. Justification and forgiveness of sins is not determined on how good you are. 
It's not determined on how much you know in this world. Justification and forgiveness of sins, eternal life, is not determined on how much work you do. It's not determined on how much you give in the offering. But your salvation is totally dependent upon humbling yourself before God and admitting that you have done wrong, repenting of sin, and turning away from our wicked ways. You see, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. It starts with repentance. If we want eternal life, we must begin by humbling ourselves before God and repenting. In verse 15, the Bible says, and they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. In these verses, children, young children and babies are being brought to Jesus. Understand, there is not one single individual in this world that is too young or too little to be brought to Jesus Christ. God knows how to show love. He knows how to show kindness to children who are not able to do things on their own. You see, it is the mind and the will of God that children should be brought unto Him. That is why I'm a firm believer in having children's ministry and why we want to do everything that we can in the very near future to have a bus ministry to reach children in this community. You see, if you and I as adults could have the faith of a little child, and if we would believe in God in the same way that little children believe, we're going to see God do a work in our lives like we've never seen. We're going to see God turn situations around. We need to become like a child, and we must humble ourselves before God. Because unless we humble ourselves like a little child, Jesus said, we're not even going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, throughout the Gospels, the, the Gospel of Luke is the only book that refers to the children as being infants. We began our life with Jesus Christ in an infancy stage of a Christian. We have to be taught. We have to learn. See, Jesus had a busy ministry. And the disciples must have been caught up in, in some kind of a hype of, of the itinerant ministry schedule. And these disciples were forgetting what was important. They forgot what really mattered. See, a lot of times in ministry, it can get busy. It can be easy to get behind in the responsibility, so to speak, of what is going on because we've got this activity going on. We have this ministry to do. We have to be at this location in a short little while. And then all of a sudden, someone stops us and they want to pour their heart out to you. And in the natural, we look at our watch and we think, I I've got places to go, I've got people to see, and a short time to get there. And we forget what is really important in life. But not Jesus. Jesus took time. When the, the disciples were trying to push people away and said, no, you can't come to Jesus. Jesus said, no, let them come to me. Jesus took time. It made no difference who they were. It made no difference where they came from. It made no difference who they were in society. Jesus took time. To teach each one. He took time to listen to them. He took time to do a work in their life. See, a lot of times in our life, we, we make our spiritual life more complicated than it really should be. That we need to ask ourselves a question. Do I have childlike faith? Do I have the faith that it takes to depend on Jesus and Jesus alone for entering into God's kingdom? Jesus said, unless you accept God's kingdom in the, in the way of a little child... You're never going to get in. Let's move on to verse 18. The Bible says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. And thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. 
And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. In this parable we see the story of a rich root. Now what we learn from the story, we need to understand that salvation is not based upon what we can do. The salvation is only attained by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. It's only the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Calvary that can save a soul from Amen. sin. And so we've been given commands in the Word of God. And it's our responsibility to keep those commands. Jesus has already told us. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. If we do not keep His commandments, then we do not have the love of God. If we do not have the love of God, then we do not have love. If we, we do not have God. And if we do not have God, we do not have an eternal destiny in heaven to spend eternity with God. See, salvation is more than just following a commandments. Just because you follow a commandment and, and you say, well, I'm not going to commit adultery well, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because there are some good things in life that you do, that is not what saves us. Salvation is not based upon how good we can be. Salvation is based upon surrendering, surrendering your life, your will, to Jesus Christ. See, everyone in this world has sinned. We were born into sin, and, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, it comes with a great price. The Bible tells us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no good thing that we could do that would cause us to become saved. It's not about our good works. It's not about anything we can do to earn salvation. See, because we have done wrong, because we humble ourselves before God and, and when we admit that we have done wrong, just like this, this publican did, he said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He recognized what he had done. He recognized that he was in sin. We acknowledge that we're nothing without God. See, we accept the sacrifice that Jesus did when, when he died on the cross of Calvary and he rose from the grave. We repent of our sins. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God's raised him. That's what it means to be saved. And when we become a child of God, the old things are passed away. And all things have become new. We invite Jesus Christ to come into our life. And when judgment day comes, and we stand before God, and we know that there are things that we used to do in life that was wrong. We have all sinned in life, and we were destined to spend eternity in hell. But because of the blood of Jesus that's been applied to your life, when you admitted that you had done wrong, when you asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, when you asked Him to forgive you of your sins, and you lived for Him, and you served Him, and you sought His face every day of your life, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, He is going to look at you, and He is going to say, I know who you are, because I have died on the cross for you. I shed my blood for you. I saved you with my own blood. And He's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You see, when we humble ourselves before Him, he sets us free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. In verse 31, it goes on to say, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit at him. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, 
neither knew they the things which were spoken. Jesus was explaining to the disciples the purpose of why he was here on this earth. His mission from the Father was to die on the cross for the sins of this world. Jesus was soon going to die, and he knew that the mission that he had been sent here on earth was to give his life through his death. Jesus was going to face the harshest of punishments in all this world when he suffered and died on the cross of Calvary. But it's through his death and through his resurrection that we can have eternal life. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, the Bible reminds us that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. That was his mission for coming into this world. I don't know of any other individual that's ever lived on the face of this world whose mission in life was to die for something that someone else did in this world. But that is what Jesus Christ did. He laid down his life for the people of this world. Verse 35 of Luke chapter 18, it goes on to say, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. There's an old saying that I heard some time ago that there is none so blind as who will not see. Throughout the early ministry of Jesus Christ, there have been several people that encountered Christ that would fit that description. In the physical realm, they could see Jesus and they were intrigued by Him. And, and many people came seeking Jesus because they had heard about the miracles and the signs and the wonders. But some of them came for other reasons. They, they came because they were in doubt. They came because they did not understand. And each of these people received an invitation to follow Jesus. And many of them walked away because, yes, they could see Him physically, but they could not see who He was spiritually. And so they walked away from a relationship with Jesus. And by doing so, they made a, a conscious decision in their life that would impact them for eternity. And so here in Luke chapter 18, we see a story about a man that claimed he would follow Jesus, but only after he buried his father. And there was another who claimed he would follow Jesus, but only after he went home and told his family goodbye. And then there was one who seemed to have an intense desire to follow Jesus. But when Jesus told him to go and, and sell his possessions and to give to the poor and to take up his cross and to follow Jesus, this man too went away in sorrow and full of tears without Jesus in his sight. All of these people were blinded by the things of this world. They saw Jesus physically, but they were blinded spiritually to see what Jesus was really in this world for. See, among these people, there were some people that were blind in their lives. They were blind disciples. They were disciples of Christ. But yet Jesus had told the disciples many times He was going to die. And these disciples still did not understand. Why? Because they were still blinded. They thought that Jesus was here right now to set up His kingdom now, to bring world peace right now. 
They didn't understand that he must first go to the cross, that he must die. All these disciples was interested in was what was in it for them. They wanted to know, well, which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which one of us is going to sit beside you on the throne in the kingdom of God? Although they were a disciple of Jesus, they still couldn't see some of the things that was right in front of them. They did not recognize the fact of who Jesus really was. See, a lot of people in the world today are spiritually blind. But for a moment tonight, I want us to look at this blind man. And I want us to try to see through the eyes of this blind man the things that the blind man would see. First of all, this blind man saw the seriousness of his situation. He was blind physically, but spiritually he recognized he was in a serious situation. Have you ever been in a situation in life that you didn't have an answer to? Have you ever been in a situation that was devastating and it was hard to try to figure out what to do? It was hard to try to make the right decision. You find yourself facing a hard time in life. Well, this blind man who is identified in Mark's gospel as Bartimaeus, he was in a devastating situation. Why? Because he was born blind. Now, a person being born blind born blind today yes it's bad it's a handicap it's a disability for them today but there are programs and there are ways that people can help one another but this was 2,000 years ago Bartimaeus' blindness was much different because as a result of his blindness he was unable to work and because he was unable to work he had no way to provide for himself he had no way to provide for his family there was no institute. There was no school of higher learning for the blind. There was no social security benefit. There was no welfare program. If he could not work, the only way he could survive in life was to sit on the side of the street and just be at the mercy of those that would pass by who would give him some money as they walked through town. See, there's a lot of people in our world today that are blind, spiritually. They do not recognize the serious situation that they are facing in their life. And the situation I'm talking about is the sin problem that people have. A lot of people are, are living in sin and they're destined to spend eternity in hell, but they don't even know it. They're lost and, and bound and they're like a runaway train headed down the wrong track and, and all of a sudden there's a sign that says the bridge is out, the bridge is out and they're saying, I've been down this road many times, I've been this way many times and I know it's okay, it's safe, but all of a sudden they don't understand the destruction that has taken place that something has happened that's changed the course and there is a warning sign and we must listen to that warning sign that tells us the bridge is out. And people find themselves headed to destruction because they fail to listen to the signs. They fail to listen to people as they teach the Word of God. They fail to listen to evangelists. They fail to listen to the warnings. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, And whom the God of this world has blinded, the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Sinners are blind to their lost condition. They're blind concerning sin. They're blind concerning their eternal destiny. Before an individual can ever come to know Jesus Christ, they must realize how serious their situation is. They must realize that they have done wrong. They must realize that without Jesus Christ in their life, they are destined to spend eternity in hell unless they repent. There may be people that's, that's watching on this webcast tonight. Maybe you find yourself lost. You find yourself spiritually blind. Maybe there's someone here tonight that you've lived for Jesus all your life. But sometimes you find yourself in a circumstance. You find yourself facing a situation and you, you feel lost. You feel confused. You feel wondering if anyone even cares. And you, you, you get to a point sometimes and we even ask God, God, do you even care? You're not alone. You're not alone. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he felt alone. He felt discouraged. His disciples had left him. This world had turned their back on him. And there he is hanging on the cross, shedding his blood for every 
thing that everyone else has done? What does Jesus say? He says, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we think we feel alone, imagine how Jesus felt when he was hanging there on that cross. When he was giving all that he had for each one of us. A lot of people are so lost, they're blind to know the, the seriousness of their situation. See, this blind man, he not only recognized the situation that he was in, but he also saw the coldness of the crowd of people that was around him. What we see here is a man that's desperate, he's blind, he's, he's helpless, he's begging for mercy, he's crying out to Jesus for a miracle, and while he is doing this, there is people in the crowd that is, that is attempting to prevent him from getting to Jesus. They're, they're trying to shove him away, they're trying to divert uh, the, the crowd of everyone else away from this blind man. What is taking place is people who were followers of Jesus Christ, people who were disciples, they were pushing away someone who desperately needed Jesus. And that happens so many times in the church world today. It was not the first time. They brought babies to Jesus. They brought young children to Jesus. The disciples said, forbid them to come to, to, to Him. But Jesus said, no, suffer the little children. Forbid them not to come. It makes no difference who they are. It makes no difference where they're from. It makes, it makes no difference what they look like. Whether they're rich, whether they're poor. Whoever they are, they're still an individual that's been created in the image and likeness of God Almighty. And our responsibility as children of God is to love them, to care for them, to let them know the truth of God's Word. It makes no difference if they're the worst sinner in town. It makes no difference if they're drunk and, and if they're high as, as all get out. If they walk into the doors of the sanctuary, I want them to know they are welcome to come in here. Regardless of their background. If they're from a worldly lifestyle as worldly as it gets. And if they walk into the doors of this sanctuary, we're going to let them in here. If they want to sit on the front row, I want them to sit on the front row. And we'll show the love of Jesus Christ to them. Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. If we cannot find enough love in our hearts to let the most rottenest, dirty, stinking sinner come in here and say, I don't care if they're from a homosexual background. They need Jesus Christ. They need Jesus Christ. Jesus loves them and He hates the sin. And God can set anyone free. He can set anyone free. It makes no difference the background. It makes no difference how young, how old, how rich, how poor. It makes no difference the circumstance. If we just let the love of God show forward and shine forth the grace of God, God will make a difference in their life and God will change them by the power of His Spirit. See, this blind man... He saw the compassion of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus recognized, although people were trying to shove him away, they were trying to divert Jesus' attention from him, Jesus still had compassion on him. And this blind man recognized it. And so he cried out. He said, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, I need my sight. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, just like the publican. He was admitting that he needed Jesus. He needed the mercy of God. He needed God's grace to come by his way. You see, that's what Jesus is still doing in this world today. He's still bringing help to those who are in need. He is still bringing forgiveness to those who are in sin. Jesus is still there saying, whosoever will, let him come unto me. See, Jesus called for this blind man to be brought to him. And Jesus asked what he could do for him. And Bartimaeus said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. You see, for years, Bartimaeus had to sit by the roadside. He was begging. He felt neglected. He felt abandoned for most of his life. But somehow, some way, someone told him about Jesus. And that made a big difference in his life. When Bartimaeus heard about Jesus, he thought, I've got to get to Jesus. He was sitting there on the streets of the city. He heard the commotion. He heard about someone named Jesus. And he said, I've heard that name before. And he saw, or he heard someone walking by and he said, tell me what's going on. And they said, Jesus is passing by. I said, Jesus is passing by. This could be my chance. 
This could be my opportunity. I, I've been in such need. I've been in such turmoil. I've been in such chaos in my life. I've heard about Jesus. I've heard about His healing power. I've heard that Jesus can make a, a, a new man out of me. He said, I need Jesus. And so he started calling out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus, thou son of David. He was persistent. He was desperate. And Jesus came by and he touched this blind man's eyes. He gave him sight. Not only could he now see what was going on spiritually, but now he could see physically. He had real faith. Uh, he had a blind man's faith, so to speak. He saw it in the spirit before he could see it in reality. That's what Hebrews 11 one says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things unseen. If we cannot see it in our spirit, if we don't see it in the spirit before we see it in the physical, then we're never going to see it at all. We must see it by faith before we can see it in the physical. Can we stand together across the sanctuary? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know there are several needs that's represented here in this worship center tonight. God knows every need. He knows every heart's desire. So what I want us to do tonight, if you have family that's in here with you, I want you to gather with your family, with your immediate family. And families can come together at the altar. Families can stay at your seat wherever you want to get together. But I, I would like for all the families to get together. Find someone to agree with in prayer. If you don't have any family with you, then, then join with someone else and we'll agree together in prayer. And God is able to supply every need. God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Father, we thank you, Jesus all that you have done. Lord, you are worthy of all the praise. And Lord, we come to you tonight, Lord, asking for your guidance, for your direction, Lord, for your will to be accomplished in our life. Lord, help us to surrender our desires. Help us to surrender our own ambitions to you, Father. Lord, to seek first your kingdom, to seek first your righteousness, Lord, to, to follow you and to serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul with all of our minds. Lord, I pray that you will open up our eyes to see. God, help us to have faith, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to see, Lord, you for who you really are. Help us, Lord, to see you as the master of everything. Help us to see you as the author and finisher of our faith. Help us to see you as our all in all. Lord, whatever we need, whatever we face, Lord, all we've got to do is trust in you. And you're able to see us through. And you're going to turn the situation around. Lord, you're the healer. You're our provider. You're the miracle working Savior. And Lord, we just praise you. We worship you, Jesus. Not because of what you have done, but because of who you are. Because you are the King of Kings. Because you are the Lord of Lords. Because you ever lived to make intercession. Lord, we worship you because... You have saved us from our sins. We worship you because you are Lord. Lord, help us to serve you, Father. Help us, Lord, to be that church, God, that you have called us to be. Help us, Lord, to do the work that you've called us to do. Lord, help us to, to, to go out into this community. Lord, as we go out very soon in the future into this community with a new bus ministry, Lord, let us reach out to boys and girls and to teenagers to adults, to senior adults, God. Lord, let us be a church that is welcoming to whosoever will, Lord. Let this be a place, Father, where the lost can come to know you. Let this be a place, God, that is a soul-saving station, Lord. Let it be a place where broken lives are made new. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that in every family, in this sanctuary tonight, Father, we pray for your hedge of protection upon each one. God, we pray for your healing touch upon those who are sick in their body. Lord, we pray for those that are facing surgeries. Lord, that you would be with them, that you would keep your hand of healing upon them, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray that you will continue to, to help us, Lord, as we overcome sickness. 
around this community, around the state, and around this nation, Father. Lord, we pray that chains of bondage would be broken. God, let people be set free from the bondages of sin. Lord, let a, let a difference be made, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we give you praise for all that you have done. For you are worthy to praise. We bless your name forevermore. Amen. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040. Sunday evenings at 6, and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.